So thank you for your willingness to embark on this adventure with us and forgive us for any hiccups. I'm Shanna Bellows, Executive Director of the Holocaust and Human Rights Center of Maine. And I'm speaking from the Michael Clark Center, named for Michael Clark, a hidden child in the Holocaust. His widow, Phyllis Jalbert, is with us tonight for this program. And we are grateful to Phyllis and her family for their ongoing support of the HHRC. The Michael Clark Center is currently closed to the public but we're hoping that tonight's event is the first of many virtual events. If you can't come to the museum, the museum and its resources will come to you. Tonight's program will begin with a prayer in the Kaddish from Rabbi Erica Ash with response by HHRC's Northern Maine educator and resident Holocaust scholar, Erica Nadelhoft. We will hear them welcoming remarks from our president, Nancy Spiegel. We have remarks delivered by our founder um, from her son, David. Then Michael Messerschmidt will read the speech he gave 35 years ago at the Blaine House. Mm -hmm. Sam Hun, our vice president, will share her experiences starting as a student with the HHRC. Our associate director, David Greenham, will share what's happening today with the HHRC educational programs in this unprecedented time. And we will close with Rabbi Erica Ash. And now we begin. We are living in difficult and unprecedented time that requires each of us to summon our innermost resources to adapt in a way of life that is different than what we had just one month ago. As we gather tonight, people we know and love are struggling with a terrible virus, COVID-19. Some people we know and love have lost their livelihoods. We are witnessing the best of people, but we are also witnessing the worst as white supremacists target Asians and Jews and flaunt swastikas and Confederate flags openly at protests. We are living in a dark time. And yet some of those among us, Gerda, Haas, and other Holocaust survivors, including Charles Rotmill, who is with us tonight, they knew a darker time. We gather tonight to remember the six million Jews and millions more murdered in the Holocaust. We gather to remember the heroism and sacrifice of the resistors. On this day, April 19th, 1943, 77 years ago, Groups of Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto began the uprising against the Germans, which lasted 27 days. They were heroes and we remember them. We also gather to honor the survivors and the lessons they instilled in us and in our organization with its founding 35 years ago. We're grateful to each one of you for joining us in this unique and special way. I'd like first to welcome Rabbi Erica Ash of Temple Beth El of Augusta for opening prayers. Temple Beth El of Augusta has been a wonderful partner for the HHRC. Welcome, Rabbi Ash. Thank you very much. I'm really honored to be here, to be with everyone today for this program. I wanted to start before we say the prayers with lighting six candles in memory of the six million who lost their lives in the Holocaust. And now we'll begin with uh, two prayers that we traditionally say, prayers of mourning for those who have died. The first is El Male Rachamim, a special prayer that we say that pictures the soul of souls of those who are departed, finding comfort um, in the wings and sheltering presence of God. If you would like to do so, I'm gonna invite you to rise for this prayer and to stay standing for Kaddish. If you'd like to stay seated, that's also fine. Uh, please do whatever is comfortable for you. Uh. 
El Male Rachamim, a prayer for those who perished in the Holocaust. El We continue now with the Kaddish, the prayer that we say in honor and memory of those who died. This special Kaddish that we say in Yom HaShoah contains the names of the camps where people perished. Yitkadal. Auschwitz-Birkenau. The Yitkadash. Wuj. Shemei Rabbah. Ponar. Vialma divra chirute. Babiyar. Viamlich malchute. Maidanek. Vechayechon uvyomechon. Chelno. Uvchaye de hol bait Israel. Kovno. Baagala uvizman kariv. Ravensbrook. The Imru, Amen. Yehe Shemei Raba Mivorach Leolam Ul Alme Almaya. Yitbarach Vish Tabach. Theresienstadt. Bayit Paar Vyit Romam. Buchenwald. Vyit Nase Vyit Hadar. Treblinka. Vyit Ale Vyit Halal. Vilna, Shemei de Kudisha, Bergen Belsen, Barich Hu, Mathausen, Leela min Kol Birchata Vishirata, Dachau, Tushpachata Venechemata, Sobibor, the Ma'an Belma, Warsaw, the Imru, Amen. Yehe Shlama Raba Min Shemaya, Bahayim Alenu Velkul Yisrael, Velkul Haolam, the Imru Amen. O se shalom bim Romal, Huya a se shalom, Alenu Velkul Yisrael, Velkul Haolam, the Imru Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Rabbi Ash and Erica Nadelhoft, our Northern Maine educator. Now I'd like to welcome the president of our board of directors, Nancy Spiegel, to say a few words. Welcome, Nancy. Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight. 30 years, 36 years ago, I met Larry Spiegel who was to become my husband within the year. He had been working in Governor Joe Brennan's office as his communication director. That year, Larry had arranged for Governor Brennan to host Holocaust survivors and allies for a tea at the Blaine House to commemorate Yamashoa. Six months after I met Larry, the gathering for Holocaust survivors and allies again had tea at the Blaine House to commemorate Yamashoa. Immediately following that transformative event, 
the Holocaust and Human Rights Center of Maine was born. Larry's life was cut short far too soon and I soon left Maine for 20 years. But Larry's parents, Jack and Ann Spiegel, went on to support the HHRC for years, including setting up a yearly scholarship for students in memory of Larry. They knew how important this work was to Larry, and I did too. When I returned to Maine, I joined the board of directors. It is now my honor to serve as president of the HHRC board today, 35 years after we were founded to carry on the legacy that Gerda Haas, Jed Davis, Burke Long, Barbara Warren, Walt Tarenko, Michael Messerschmidt, Steve Black, Ida Joyce Levine, and Nan Amato formally initiated on April 23rd, 1985. Steve Black remains on her board, as does Ragnil Badi, who was involved as well in the beginning of this organization. We are grateful to them, and we are grateful to Holocaust survivors like Gerda, who had the courage and vision to share their stories with us. In honor of today, I have a prayer I'd like to share with you from a favorite rabbi of mine. At my bar mitzvah and his, dedicated to the memory of a 13 year old hero of the resistance by Rabbi Howard Kahn. When I was 13, I became a bar mitzvah. When he was 13, he became a bar mitzvah. When I was 13, my teachers taught me to put tefillin on my arm. When he was 13, his teachers taught him to throw a hand grenade with his arm. When I was 13, I studied the pathways of the Bible and roadways of the Talmud. When he was 13, he studied the canals of Warsaw and the sewers of the ghetto. At my bar mitzvah, I took an oath to live as a Jew. At his bar mitzvah, he took an oath to die as a Jew. At my bar mitzvah, I blessed God. At his bar mitzvah, he questioned God. At my bar mitzvah, I lifted my voice and sang. At his bar mitzvah, he lifted his fists and fought. At my bar mitzvah, I read from the scroll of the Torah. At his bar mitzvah, he wrote a scroll of fire. At my bar mitzvah, I wore a new tallit over a new suit. At his bar mitzvah, he wore a rifle and bullets over a suit of rags. At my bar mitzvah, I started my road of life. At his bar mitzvah, he began his road to martyrdom. At my bar mitzvah, family and friends came to say l'chaim. At his bar mitzvah, Rabbi Akiba and Trumpledor, Hannah and her seven sons came to escort him to heaven. At my bar mitzvah, they praised my voice, my song, my melody. At his bar mitzvah, they praised his strength, his courage, his fearlessness. When I was 13, I was called up to the Torah. I went to the Bima. When he was 13, his body went up in smoke. His soul rose to God. When I was 13, I became a bar mitzvah and lived. When he was 13, he became a bar mitzvah and lives now within each of us. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. We are deeply grateful for our entire board of directors. In addition to Nancy Spiegel, our board includes Sherry Stevens, Peter Mendel, Emily Breitner, Phyllis Jalbert, Bob Katz, Joan Kidman, Megan Ladd, Lyons, Nick Mills, Adelaide Solomon Jordan, Jenna Vendil, Tam Hun, 
Steve Black, and Ranghil Bade. As Nancy mentioned, Steve Black was a founder and Runghild has been a board member continuously for 35 years. It's a congenial and hardworking crew and a pleasure to serve with them. Now, for a message from our founder, Gerda Haas. Gerda wasn't feeling up to joining us tonight, but her son David is here to speak on her behalf in her words. David, your mother was a founding inspiration for this organization and we are grateful to her. Welcome, David. Thank you. My name is Gerda Haas. My story could be the story of a thousand young Jewish women growing up in Nazi Germany who were taken away to a concentration camp. Only I was luckier than most of the others. I was taken to Theresienstadt, which was both a concentration camp and a ghetto. And I worked there from age 17 to 19 as a baby nurse until I was liberated and taken to Switzerland. My transport was rumored to be heading toward freedom rather than certain death. And after I was selected, a typhoid epidemic broke out in the ghetto that decimated the remaining population. My mother and my sister perished during the war, as did the family of my future husband, Rudy. I eventually came to Maine with Rudy and slowly learned the skills that most Americans take for granted, like shopping and cooking, and where I eventually went to college at Bates and then graduate school at the University of Southern Maine in my 40s and became a librarian at Bates College. Today, retired at age 97, I have a thriving Scrabble game, as well as four children, 11 grandchildren, and five great-grandchildren. It was an adjustment for me and my kids as we grew into an extended family, which they did not have growing up. 35 years ago, on April 23rd, 1985, the governor of Maine, Joe Brennan, had invited a group of state officials, their wives, and the survivors of the Holocaust who had settled in Maine, including myself and my entire family, to the State House in Augusta to comm commemorate the killing of the Jews in Germany and other European countries, and to remind us of the revolt in the Warsaw Ghetto. As we walked from the governor's mansion over to the state library, we chatted and it became clear to me that Maine students did not know this little sliver of history and that it was not part of the curriculum in our schools, including three main colleges that I was familiar with, Bates, Bowdoin, and the University of Maine at Augusta. There was also, it was, and it was also clear that there were no books in any library in Maine where teachers could prepare lessons on the Holocaust and its meaning. The next question was what to do about it. This is when the idea took hold to introduce Holocaust studies in the high schools and I had to add a major in Holocaust studies in these three colleges. We needed books and films and experienced speakers and we needed support and help from the men and women who are our main teachers. We needed a Holocaust and human rights center in Maine. Together with the governor and members of the state library, we made our ideas and dreams come true. We have, in my mind, created the best Holocaust center in the East with the most dedicated staff. In Hebrew, we say Borach Hashem, which simply means thank God for all of our blessings. As the Holocaust Human Rights Center enters its 35th year, I would like to congratulate the center's leadership, the state of Maine and the hundreds of teachers who have used HHRC resources as a starting point for engaging students in discussion of what it means to provide human rights to a country and its citizens and how fragile those rights can become. Thank you for all you have done. 
We are humbled and grateful that Gerda had the foresight and vision to start this amazing organization. And we, should, we are so glad that she is healthy and that you, David, her son, was able to convey her message to us tonight. Thank you. We're using technology in another way tonight to bring you back in time to that T 35 years ago. Michael Master Schmidt, who serves to this day as clerk of the HHRC, spoke to those assembled at the governor's mansion. Michael's parents, Sonia and Cantor Kurt Messerschmidt were Holocaust survivors who were also beloved members of the greater Portland community until their passing. With support from Steve Hochstadt, they authored the powerful memoir, Death and Love in the Holocaust, on sale today at the HHRC. We asked Michael to give that powerful speech from 1985 again tonight. Michael, welcome. Thank you very much, Shannon. There are approximately half a million people worldwide who are children of survivors of the Nazi Holocaust. Most of these children have grown up far away from the countries where their parents were raised and were subjected to that particular persecution. The majority have been raised either in the state of Israel or in America. The children of the Holocaust defy simple categorization. Some have become totally immersed in the development of a Jewish military in Israel capable of warding off Latter-day Holocausts, perhaps expressing anguish or anger at a perceived lack of fighting spirit on the part of their ancestors. Others have spent years in therapy, trying to cope with the guilt at not having suffered as much as did their parents, or guilt brought on by simply having been born when their unborn cousins were never afforded that opportunity. Still others consciously block out the heritage of horror altogether and forge ahead with a new identity, totally devoid of apparent connection with Jewish victimization. Nevertheless, one can say with a reasonable amount of certainty that virtually all are bound by an awareness of certain characteristics of their heritage. All of their families have suffered great personal tragedy. All have suffered from great senses of displacement and all realize their family trees have certain withered or dead limbs. I come before you today as one such child of the Holocaust, the only American born member of my immediate family. My parents were born and raised in or near Berlin where they were arrested 10 years into the Third Reich. My sister was born in Munich a year and a half after the Allies defeated Germany. By the time I was born, eight years had passed since my parents were liberated, three since they had first seen the Statue of Liberty, and two since they had moved to Portland. I was raised in what I thought was a very American household, which is what I am sure my parents wanted for me and for my sister. My parents made a conscious decision not to speak German around the home and chose not to raise me bilingual. All along, however, I was aware that my background was different. I learned at a young age that the number tattooed on my father's arm had been put there by the Nazis. I knew my parents had been in concentration camps. I knew that the few relatives we had who had survived the war had been scattered by fate to distant parts of the earth. Unlike my friends, I never had any grandparents, another generally common denominator among the children of the Holocaust. Although I was obviously aware my parents had survived the camps, the Holocaust was not a frequent topic of conversation in our home. My sister and I learned bits and pieces about their experiences in the war, and whatever questions we asked were usually answered, though generally without much detail. We were not inundated with Holocaust stories. We were not burdened with reminders nor made to feel guilty that we had not suffered as they had. My parents were not refugees and that they did not leave Europe in the immediate aftermath of the war. My sister was three years old at the time and they based their decision on the feeling that she should not be raised among Germans. To me, 
Germany was a symbol of my parents' suffering, of the dispersal of my relatives, and of the death of my grandparents. My father's brother, who also survived the war, moved to America afterwards and raised a family in Minnesota. His daughter, Steffi, my first cousin, decided as she approached her th mid thirties to explore her roots. She took a job teaching at an American school in Berlin and moved there on a three-year contract. She wrote me and told me of her search for her history. I felt overwhelmed with an urgency to return to the land my parents left. So I visited my cousin. There were huge gaps in my sense of my own history and I saw a golden opportunity to fill in some of them. My visit was filled with emotionally challenging moments and experiences. I realized that I had waited almost 30 years to experience those feelings and I wanted to make certain that I missed none. I made a conscious effort to confront the trying situations my visits would produce and each such visit produced an element of satisfaction and an element of grief. Perhaps I was striving to acquire a sense of suffering. I did not grow up deprived of anything that was truly important or necessary. I frankly was never victimized personally by any anti-Semitic slur directed at me individually, nor was I ever discriminated against because of my Judaism. My first full day in West Berlin, I felt a strong desire to visit whatever remained of Judaism in Berlin. I found a small Jewish community center guarded by armed police. The building was hardly inviting and certainly did not exude any of the vitality that the city itself exhibits. Inside the building, I proceeded into a foyer where a wall simply listed the names of the concentration camps in a formation that represented their geographical relationship to one another. A plaque nearby dedicated itself and the center to the memory of some 60,000 Berlin Jews who had worked for the Jewish community and who died at the hands of the Nazi persecution. In West Berlin today, a city of 2.1 million people, there are only 6,500 Jews living, a tiny remnant of the community in which I might have been born and raised had history afforded that opportunity. We traveled to the outskirts of Munich and visited the concentration camp at Dachau. We knew that our parents had not been interned there but we did not know at the time that my father had actually sung at the exercises dedicated the Dacha Memorial after the war. We toured the museum together, staring dumbfounded at the photographs of the suffering and of the dead. We had seen other similar pictures before, either in film or in books, but the powerfulness of realizing that the photographs were taken within several hundred yards of where we stood was devastating. We posed for pictures for our fathers by a monument which said in four languages, never again. As I prepared to leave Dachau, I proudly signed a registration book for visitors to the museum with my name and date and the addendum, an American born son of camp survivors. When we returned to Berlin, we went to visit Udenauer Straße, where our fathers were raised and where they, along with their mother and my mother were arrested. The particular apartment building was now in a working class Turkish immigrant neighborhood, but apparently looked much as it had when they were growing up. I had a terrific lump in my throat as I stood in the courtyard of that apartment building. More than any other time during my stay in Germany, I knew I was standing where my family had stood in times of trouble and in times of fear. Here Stephanie and I stood almost 40 years to the week after our fathers had been arrested. And we walked through the corridors of the building, trying to sense what it must have felt like to hear the sounds of the boots of the soldiers when they came looking for them. It was a moment of great triumph to be able to stand there 40 years later and to know that my family had survived, had prospered in a new land, and had produced a child who could come back and stand in those hallways and say with pride and yet with great humility and gratefulness that we have survived, but Hitler did not. For all the emotional trauma associated with my visit to the land of my ancestors' tragedies, 
I seized upon another opportunity a year later to return. I tagged along when my parents decided to visit Southern Germany and Munich for the first time since they had boarded a ship bound to America on appropriately the 4th of July in 1950. While in Munich, I visited, uh, I was invited to a party celebrating the bat mitzvah of a young German Jewess. I found myself seated at a table that evening with a dozen other young adults, every one of whom was the, was the child of survivors. None had been born in Germany, but all with or without their parents had made their way back. I had never interacted with so many children of survivors. I felt a tremendous bond toward them and at the same time a great distance because I had great difficulty accepting their decision to return to Germany to live. They explained that in many ways, they felt surrounded by an alien society that did not and could not fully appreciate how they felt as children of survivors. On the other hand, they felt it terribly important to ensure that that very culture not forget about them. And they intended to make their presence known so that they could not be forgotten. My parents and I visited the beautiful little village of Surberg, where my father had escaped from a death march and had been liberated. We visited the mass grave of the more than 60 men who remained with the march when my father left it. All were massacred by their German guards. Their individual identities remain unknown. None spoke the German language and none were even Jewish. They were simply more victims of the Holocaust. We sat nearby that cemetery in utter silence for several very long minutes, pondering what would have been my father's unmarked grave. Finally, my mother, in barely a whisper, remarked that she never would have known anything of the fate of her husband had he been among those massacred near Surber. Then, with the sensitivity that only a person who had known great sorrow could feel, she immediately expressed concern for the families of all those unknown men of unknown extraction lying anonymously in their unmarked graves. Families who never knew when, where, if, or how their loved ones perished. My father was originally to have participated in today's program with me, but he is on his way back to Surber, where he will speak at ceremonies later this week, commemorating the victims of the war, especially those lying in that unmarked mass grave. I know his message there will be much the same as is mine here. It is because of a sense of reconciliation that I've been able to visit Germany and my parents have been able to return to visit. Notwithstanding that reconciliation, we have not allowed ourselves to forget, to ignore or to rewrite history in order to interchange the victims with the oppressors. These memories will not merely fade away with the passage of years or of generations. For I have stood in the hallway of the Udenauer Strasser apartment building and felt as if they were coming for me too. I have stood by the mass unmarked grave that might have precluded my very existence. I have marveled at the miracles that, my, that have made my life even possible and that have allowed the son of survivors the opportunity to speak in a free country in the governor's mansion. But I never forget the monument at Dachau, never again. Remarks delivered at Blaine House, Augusta, Maine, April 23, 1985. Our message from 1985 is equally important and no less urgent today. My mother died in 2010, my father in 2017, from their legacy and the legacy provided by countless survivors who have shared their oral and written stories. We know we cannot hide from or ignore painful truths, 
Rather, we need to confront bigotry and hate when we see it, to appreciate that history unfortunately can repeat itself, and to take all necessary action to assure that never again becomes a reality and not a mere hope. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. We know your parents would be so glad and so proud of you to hear you tonight. Their story will not be forgotten. Gerda, Michael, and the founders named by Nancy went from the Blaine House to file papers for the HHRC. The date was April 23rd, 1985. A few of those founders are here with us tonight, and I'd like to pause to recognize them. Jed Davis, Burke Long, and Steve Black. Thank you, all of you. You had a vision, you made it a reality. One of our founders, Walt Taranko, is no longer with us, but he's represented on this Zoom meeting tonight by his widow, Donna Taranko Moulton, and his family's commitment to the HHRC continues. Just last month, they contributed to the installation of new video conferencing technology at the Michael Clark Center. And we can't thank the Taranko family enough for carrying on Walt's legacy. The original Articles of Incorporation stated the goals of the HHRC. And I quote from those historic papers, the purpose of this organization is to foster public education about the Nazi Holocaust and issues of democratic human rights which grow out of reflection on that historic event. That purpose, education of the next generation was there from the very beginning. And over time, the HHRC developed powerful programs that have now reached thousands of Maine students from every corner of the state. One of those former students is a leader on our board today. Tam Han serves as vice president of the HHRC board. But she started with the HHRC back when Sharon Nichols was executive director. Sharon is with us tonight. Sharon spent years guiding the HHRC from its infancy through the opening of the beautiful Michael Clark Center. Tam is going to speak about the power of educational programs at the HHRC. Tam, welcome. Thank you, Shanna. I am honored to serve on the Holocaust and Human Rights Center of Maine Board, whose programming as a high school student gave me my voice, empowered me to do peer-to-peer -peer civil rights training, helped me reclaim my birth name and the many opportunities it afforded me in Maine and beyond. I grew up in a small town in Maine called Winthrop. There, my family of Polish and Vietnamese descent had deep roots in the community. By the age of four, my parents learned I had a proclivity for speaking multiple languages. However, I had a hard time grasping English. And the school system I would matriculate into would not offer English as a second language to help facilitate, in their words, my integration. When I arrived at the school, I experienced prejudice from a teaching assistant removing me from a self-portrait coloring activity because in their words, there wasn't a crayon that matched my skin, to a teacher introducing foreign currency to the class and telling them I was worth only a peso, to ultimately children jeering on a bus singing the antacid jingle, tum to tum tum tums, the closest pronunciation to my given name that led my parents to ultimately remove me from the school system. I would enter a new system nearly an hour away. The teacher, the first person of color I had ever met outside of the Vietnamese community, introduced me to new approaches to learning. Also, she spoke another language and took the time to get to know me. I trusted her and never felt less than enough. And within two months, I had accelerated ahead a full grade and was entered into the gifted and talented program. 
which I continued in high school, yet I still struggled with English, um, this time with writing. So I would take ESL classes alongside newly arrived immigrants and refugees to the Augusta area. It further strengthened my language aptitude in other language classes, but it also gave me a chance to connect with another educator, this time an ESL instructor who invested in my success. And in 1994, she introduced me to the Diversity of Leadership Institute, a program that brought together high school student leaders of diverse perspectives, thought, and ethnic and racial backgrounds statewide to combat biases and address prejudicial attitudes in high schools. Hmm. It equipped me with the language to talk about biases and prejudice and its impact on students in the community who might otherwise endure the burden that had been inflicted on me or those that might have remained in silence. This program was the first time I reclaimed my narrative as a source of empowerment. And I shared it with others as an emblematic cautionary tale to those who did not see the value or need for diversity or inclusion or even civil rights in school communities. My worldview on what I could achieve and how I could make a difference in my community and beyond completely changed. None of which would have been possible without the generosity of the Holocaust and Human Rights Center who fully funded the program a program I was a part of for the better part of 10 years. By the time I graduated high school, I reclaimed my name and, and it would have taken place at my high school graduation the first time my friends would have heard it. While in college, I had the opportunity to serve on the Holocaust and Human Rights Center board for a one year term as a student, the youngest board member to serve in its history. And nearly 20 years later, in 2017, I was invited to serve on the board again. It is truly an honor and a privilege to serve an organization whose mission is to reflect and act against injustice, to be part of something larger than myself and give back to the state of Maine, where I call home, made richer by the Holocaust and Human Rights Center. Thank you. Thank you, Tam. We are grateful for your leadership. Our educational program has undergone some significant changes since Tam's time as a student. Our Associate Director, David Greenham, is here to talk about the HHRC's educational programs today and a special event we're doing for students this Tuesday, April 21st, to mark Yom HaShoah. David, take it away. Well, thank you very much for asking me to share some information about our educational work. As you may know, the HHRC has developed a reputation for impactful educational outreach opportunities, both at the Michael Clark Center in Augusta and at schools throughout the state. And when Shenna first came on board as executive director, one of her first goals was to seek funding to expand our outreach and to add broader topics of anti-bias and racism to our existing programs in Holocaust studies, civil rights, and immigration. The results have been spectacular, of course. Thanks to the support of several foundations and many individuals, we have been able to hire three part-time educators, Marfine covering Southern Maine, Piper covering Western Maine, and Erica covering Northern Maine. I work with the students and teachers who visit us here in Augusta, and I also visit schools in Central Mid Coast and sometimes in Down East Maine. Your financial support allows us to present our programs free for schools. And what makes our program unique is that we work very hard to present ourselves as a partner with the teachers that we serve. We're not the outside expert but rather another voice to help present the important concepts within each lesson plan. And because we focus on these themes so extensively, we can also add specific details by drawing our own archival materials and incorporating the award-winning pedagogical approaches of our partners, including 
facing history in ourselves, teaching tolerance, Yad Vashem's echoes and reflections, the Anti-Defamation League, the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, and many others. As you know, times change drastically and suddenly for us all. In fact, during the week of March 16th, we were scheduled to see students at George Stevens Academy in Blue Hill. We were talking with Madawaska High School. We were going to Ellsworth Elementary Middle School, as well as present programs for teachers at conferences in Portland, Farmington, and Bangor. But by the end of the day on Monday, March 16th, all had been canceled, along with every other scheduled event through the end of the month. And since then, of course, everything's been canceled and schools won't be in session again this year. We had the option of recording all our programs and simply posting them online for teachers and students to use as needed. But we recognized that we'd lose the very immediacy that has made our program so valuable for teachers in the first place. The one size fits all approach doesn't really work with the challenging topics we address at the HHRC. We realized that this was an opportunity to rethink our programs and create a system that would allow the HHRC to further expand its options. And so after consulting with several teachers and leaders within the educational community, we set on a plan to develop a virtual educational system and create a module-based series of online educational programs that would allow the expansion of both the breadth and the depth of our workshops. The first program that we're focusing on is our most popular one, Decision-Making in Times of Injustice. It's a program that focuses on the rise of the Nazis and the impossible decisions that people were forced to make. We're excited to announce that on Tuesday, we're taking our first program live with a special one hour virtual version of the program for students in grades six through 12 statewide. Students signed up through their teachers and we're pleased to report that we've received a very positive response. And it's a pilot, but it's an important first step. Rising to the challenge of taking our traditional in-person programming online has led to some new innovations that we believe will strengthen our overall program. For example, we're using this time to expand our program by creating these online modules, each lasting about 15 to 30 minutes and providing students and teachers with the opportunity to examine more deeply the conditions that existed the biases that were in play, and the action or inaction of the people who saw these events occur. Our new sections include an examination of what it is to be Jewish, how the Nazis gained power, and what specific events occurred between 1933 and 1938 that caused the dehumanization of Jews and other tar targeted populations of the Nazi regime. To localize these programs, we will incorporate accounts from Maine survivors of the Holocaust, headlines from Maine newspapers, and other tools which bring the world story home to Maine. And we will also offer contextual Zoom chats or question answer periods to again, bring another voice into the conversation and enhance the uniqueness of each program. And once schools are in session again, we'll be able to resume our in-person 60 minute programs, but we'll also have the opportunity for a teacher who can't schedule a time for us to visit to use HHRC resources in their classrooms and have a contact to help them navigate the available modules. While the prospect of creating these new modules might seem daunting, it's really just a case of us going back to the creation of the programs and sharing our notes and discoveries and the valuable parts of the story that we never had time to tell. We're looking forward to this journey and the team is working harder than ever to ensure that students and teachers continue as our mission states to encourage individuals and communities to reflect and act upon their moral responsibilities to confront prejudice, intolerance and discrimination. Thanks very much. We are so lucky to have David on our team. Thank you, David. 
He, Marfine Chan, Piper Dumont, and Erica Nadelhoft are working hard to bring our education programs online. And our entire staff can only do what we do with the support from our dedicated office manager, Phil Fishman. We have a great team at the HHRC. We will close tonight's program with an original prayer from Rabbi Ash. Rabbi Ash, thank you and welcome back. Thank you. Elohinu velohe avotenu veimotenu, our God and God of our ancestors. We have gathered together tonight to remember those who perished during the Holocaust but we have not only focused on the monumental tragedy of the Holocaust, we have also found hope. We have heard how a group of Mainers responded to this tragedy with commemoration and with action. We are inspired by the stories of the founders of the Holocaust and Human Rights Center and by the important work that continues today. Tonight, we are grateful for the opportunity to be with one another and to see each other's faces even though we cannot be together in person. In this time of physical distancing, we are increasingly aware of the necessity to create connections, to learn from one another, and to find hope and comfort. And so as we leave our time together, may we engage in the sacred work of tikkun olam, of repairing the world. May we not wait another moment. May we start today with a continued resolve to fight injustice. May we repair the world with love for one another. May this program remind us of the horrors of the past and the hope for the future. And may the memory of all those who were murdered inspire us to become more loving and kind and to speak out against injustice wherever it occurs. Thank you. Rabbi Ash, thank you all of you for joining us tonight. We are so moved and we hope you are too. We have a moral responsibility now and forever to never forget, to work toward never again, and to do everything that we can to confront prejudice, discrimination, and intolerance. Whether you're joining us tonight for the first time, or have been with us since the inception of this special organization. Thank you. From the bottom of our hearts, have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you. That's the end of our program. Good night. <laughs> Good night.